Hi guys, Aaron Barker, Artistic Director of the Story Collider here with a brief message before today's episode. If you follow us on social media, you may have noticed that this past Giving Tuesday we announced new rewards for donations to the Story Collider, including comic books of some of our stories and coffee mugs with our logo, which, by the way, I must say make excellent gifts for the science story lover in your life. So to get your comic book and or mug, stop by storycollider.org and sign up for monthly donations. Or until this Tuesday, December 5th, you can also receive the rewards for one-time donations starting at $20. As you know, the money you donate to the Story Collider helps us continue to produce these shows and podcasts and run workshops and empower scientists to tell stories about their work, something that we really believe is so important right now. And we're so grateful to all of you for your support. So find out more at storycollider.org and enjoy the show. Thanks. Calling all kid inventors. The Little Bits Droid Inventor Kit is here for the holidays. With this toy, you can make an R2 unit. And you can invent a custom droid that hasn't even been imagined yet. Check out the Little Bits Droid Inventor Kit at littlebits.com, Walmart, Amazon, and Apple. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I it felt, felt, felt I feel right. I was so and I just thought, well, I had figured it wow. out. I it was like that tall. golden moment because science was on my side. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week, we're bringing you two stories about psychotropic substances, from a cancer survivor who joins an experimental trial on magic mushrooms, and a comedian who discovers ayahuasca. Our first story this week is from Gail Thomas. It was recorded in July 2017 at the Crane Theater in New York City. The theme of that night was pain. When my nurse practitioner asked me if I wanted to do a study For cancer survivors with anxiety and depression, I was offended. (laughs) It had been two years. I got through the chemo, I got through the relationship breakup, I even got through the loss of my little dog, Rusty. I survived my cancer a year later, he didn't survive his. But I'd gotten through the post-traumatic stress syndrome, I didn't overreact at laundromats anymore. I could be flexible about where I folded my towels. In fact, cancer was good for my self-esteem. I learned something that a Midwestern girl doesn't necessarily know. I learned how to stand up for myself. My decisions were important. I stood up to doctors. I stood up to family members. I stood up to cab drivers. I stood up to that guy at the laundromat. Anybody who wasn't good for me was out. I got rid of all the toxic people, and there was no one left. (laughs) I was different now I I had changed into somebody that I didn't really know my life was really exciting when I was making treatment decisions chemo or radiation, life or death now that I was back with the regular people it was like Starbucks or the local cafe you know, soy milk or skim it was dull an ordinary. I wanted to talk to people who had life or death situations. I, I felt separate. Like I had gone off to this far planet and then I came back and I didn't speak the language anymore. So all right, I said to my nurse practitioner, tell me about this, this study. She ushered them into the room, Dr. Ross, who had, who was very straight, laced, sort of crew, you know, short, clean cut haircut and a, and a tweed jacket and, and sort of a nerdy looking awkward fellow about mid thirties, accompanied by Gabby who, whose hair was up in a bun and she wore a flowy skirt and they sat in front of me. And Dr. Ross explained that this study had been done um, previously at UCLA and John Hopkins and that I would only need to do one drug and then one placebo. And there would also be four months of free therapy Now, I didn't really want any more therapy, but I do like a good deal. (laughs) So 
I said, all right, so tell me, what, what's the drug? Psilocybin. I was like, what? Magic mushrooms. Oh my God. Timothy Leary and like Ram Dass and all that stuff. Magic mushrooms. I, I'd never had the guts to do them myself. I knew other people who'd had, but I had I was I was sort of a straight laced kid in college and in my twenties and, and I already was kinda hyper and a little bit of an overthinker, so I was sure that I would be the person that would jump off the roof. <laughs> but this was an FDA study. My friend Joe says I'm the luckiest, unlucky person he's ever met. I got cancer, but I get to do mushrooms legally with FDA approval. It's like winning the cancer lottery. Sign me up. I was patient number 13. We started the therapy and there was lots of forms to fill out. Gabby had, it was like rate one to five. Do you feel depressed? How are you eating? Have you gained weight? Do you ha are you happy? Do you have suicidal thoughts? The forms were, were, went on and on. But finally, it came the day for the dosing. I was so excited. They had asked me to bring items from home that, that were comforting for me. So I brought Rusty the dog's little squeaky duck and I brought some pictures and some, and some, they had flowers there for me and snacks and we stood and, and I walked into the room and they had two chairs where the two doctors, Dr. Ross and Dr. Cresselia would sit and watch me on this fold out photon while I had my experience. I thought that might be kind of boring for them, but it was my day. So <laughs> we got in a circle and we held hands and um, doctor, they had a chalice, actually, that they had this little pill that had been measured specially for me, that I guess had all the synthetic mushroomy stuff inside it, and, or, or not, and it, had, it was in a little uh, 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 a glass, little glass jar with my name on it, and they put it in a chalice. <laughs> and we stood in a circle and held hands, and he asked me for my intention. I'm like, I, peace, love, my intention is to do the drug, give me the drug. <laughs> I took the drug and I laid down. They had a pillow and a blanket and I put it over me. And oh, they also had these, uh, they had gotten together, these NYU doctors, this whole team of people and made this playlist of like crazy music that I could listen to the whole time, you know? And they had an eye mask for me to wear. My friends had all told me, you know, you should really go out into the woods. You need to be with nature if you're gonna do shrooms. You gotta do nature. I'm like, this is an FDA study. I'm pretty sure they're not, they're not gonna let me out of the room, okay? So. <laughs> So I laid down, and I laid down, and I sat there, and I, and I didn't feel anything. And I was like, oh, damn, this is the placebo. And then about 30 minutes in, there was this rush of information into my head. It was just all coming at the same time. It was like every philosophy class, every yoga class, every deep thought that I'd ever heard of or I thought of, had heard in my whole life was all coming in at the same time. It was a lot of information. There, were, there, weren't, there weren't really like dancing like lampshades like I thought there would be. It was more like little sketches and stuff. I saw, I saw two paper mache colorful cow heads going across the screen and I saw a, 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 a cat that was chewing on my bicycle. I don't know what that meant. But it was a lot of information. I, I, I lifted the, the, I clutched onto my little dog's rusty toy and I, I lift, opened up my eye mask to look at Dr. Ross and he's sitting there and he's like, trust and let go, T-L-O, trust and let go. So I put the eye mask back on. And it just kept coming, all the information. And then I started, then I suddenly saw this, this beautiful field, like a little house on the prairie. And it was this gorgeous open field with a little house in the back. And there was this lady standing in the middle of the field. And she looked so happy and so healthy. And I thought maybe she was me or somebody I admire greatly. And then I saw all these, these I saw a, a table. I saw, I suddenly was over this table. And it was sort of like a round, this round table, like a pie chart. And there were these little sections that were divided out of the table. And in one of the sections, I looked at it. I looked down on top of it, and it was cancer at the table. And I was like, oh my God, cancer's at the table. And I looked, and there was more. And then my family was at the table. They were all like sitting around. And I thought about how I judged them, because they hadn't said the right thing when I had cancer. My brother wanted me to do tons of treatment, and my sister didn't want to do research, and my mom came for the surgery, but she wouldn't help me out with anything. I ended up waiting on her. But then I realized, you know what? They, they tried their best. They meant well. They loved me. They're actually there for me. And 
then I started to see, see more things and I thought about how I was an artist and I used to paint and I used to draw and I, I don't do that anymore. And I thought about how I went on stage and I used to perform and I really liked that, but I didn't do it anymore. And I wanted to participate because I didn't need to be isolated because we're all connected and that didn't make any sense. You have to participate because it doesn't matter if you're like old or young or sick or, or healthy, that you're all together because we're all connected. And so, you know, death has a purpose because the purpose of death is to tell you that you should live. You should really have a good time because you're not dead. You should just have fun. You're alive, right? You know? And so it just kept going. And then the IRS was at the table. I looked at the table and the IRS was there because <laughs> it was just after tax time. <laughs> And I was really annoyed because I was like, I don't want the IRS in this trip. This is supposed to be a spiritual journey. And then I realized the IRS is at the table because everything's connected. Death and life and my family and cancer and the IRS, they all belong at the table together because we're all connected. And eventually it sort of, the trip sort of faded out. And I took off my eye mask and I looked at the doctors and they asked me some more questions and they had me fill out some more forms and I wrote everything down. <laughs> is why I remember it. And uh, my friend picked me up, they gave me some flowers, and I went home in the cab. And I remember being in the cab driving home, and we, we passed these two women sitting at a cafe, an outdoor cafe, and I was like, look at them, they're friends, they're talking, they're really happy, they're friends, they like to be together, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> I had the, the great privilege of being patient number 13 out of 29. The results of the study, I guess they call it a paper, was published this past December in the uh, Journal of Psychopharmacology. The name of the study, the paper was Rapid and Sustained Symptom Reduction Following Psilocybin Treatment for Anxiety and Depression in, pans in Patients with Life-Threatening Cancer, a Randomized Controlled Trial. <laughs> yeah, it's long, too. Um, it was very successful in over 80% of us, they, they noted a rapid and immediate decrease in stress that lasted at least six months. That was five years ago, and uh, I have changed. Things happen. And you know, the things that happen are not actually good or they're bad. They're just things that happen. I don't have a perfect life now. I don't have the perfect job or a relationship, but things happen. One of the things that happened is I was cast in a commercial playing the, um, the supportive sister of a cancer survivor, and in one of the, the times we were, we were shooting everything, I walked by the monitor and I noticed that the camera was focused above and looking down on our family's table, where we would all sit together and support each other. We are all connected. Someone made this building. They built this building. Somebody put all the buildings all over New York City, and they made the subway, and they made the streets, and they made the beer, and they made your shirt, and they made my dress. Sometimes I feel lonely, but I know that I'm not alone, and I do not feel separate anymore. Thank you. That was Gail Thomas. Gail is a Moth Story Slam winning storyteller who also teaches for the Story Studio. Voiceover credits include David Letterman, Beavis and Butthead, and Angelo Rules. Her short comedy, My BFF, rated 95% funny on Funny or Die and was audience favorite at New Filmmakers. She was a speechwriter for the Tribeca Film Festival and the Gotham Awards. Stay tuned for our next story after this message from our sponsor. Day-to-day -day life has plenty of room for improvement. Simple Human has introduced a voice-activated sensor trash can for easier access to the trash when life gets messy. Tested to last more than 150,000 cycles, Simple Human trash cans are engineered to quietly make life simpler. Visit simplehuman.com and enter the code COLLIDER to receive 15% off your sensor trash can with voice and motion activation. Again, that's promo code COLLIDER at simplehuman.com. Welcome back. Our second story today is from Mike Kaplan. It was recorded in September 2017 at Caveat in New York City. 
The theme of that night was New Beginnings. Uh, This is a story about the universe. The universe is made of science, so let there be story. In the beginning, uh, there was everything, uh, but not the me part of everything. So then billions of years passed, if time is a thing, or thousands of years, if it's a different thing. (laughs) Then there was me. I was born to two parents that I'll call uh, mom and dad to protect their identities. (laughs) I'm calling mom, dad, and dad, mom for extra security. (laughs) They taught me a lot of stuff relevantly to right now. They taught me as a child, uh, don't smoke, don't drink, don't do drugs. I have never smoked. I don't care that much about drinking. And uh, now for the rest of the story. I was raised uh, Jewish-ish, you know? Like, I believed in uh, quote-unquote God. Uh, I believed in an afterlife. That was very calming to think about, the fact that I would keep being, because I'd always been, so that was nice to be like, oh, yeah, good, it's not going to be, it's not going to stop. <laughs> that would that'd be terrifying. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, did you ever think about not being? Oh, God. Uh, the void. You know, it's like... <laughs> It was the most terrifying thing in the world or out of the world, in and out of the world, uh, Schrodinger's world. It's hard to tell. And it's weird that God, you know, there's so many things that go into the idea of God. Like there's the, you know, created everything part. And then there's the uh, like rules and ethics and governs what's going on during life part. And then the afterlife part. And like they always get sort of lumped all together. Like, and they could all work together. Like, uh, you know, in theory, uh, the three branches of government do. Or they could not work together at all, like in practice, how the three branches of government (laughs) don't. Uh, So I stopped believing in the amalgamation version of God, you know, that was everything, uh, because I heard that God was supposed to be all loving and there was uh, suffering in the world. And I was like, oh, if God was all loving, why wouldn't there be, I don't know, like zero suffering? The hardest part to get rid of, the hardest part to let go of was the afterlife part. So I held on to that for a while, and here's how I did it. I was like, well, there's, no, there's obviously no evidence, no proof, no support empirically for an afterlife, but there's also no proof against it. <laughs> there, nobody has any proof that there's not. So I'm like, it's 50-50. <laughs> it's like some for, some against. Like, it's 50-50. You can choose whichever one you like. <laughs> That's what I did. I was, uh, I was a good kid. I got good grades in school. I think I was nice. They didn't grade you on that. Shows where our priorities are in society, am I right? That wasn't very nice, I'm sorry. But I liked being good according to the rules, you know, it was mathematical, logical, you know, just very structurally sound, you know, you could input studying and then output good grades and praise, you know, follow along the path, like, you know, school, college, job, life, living. That's what, that was what it was all about. You know, that was what the rules were about. You know, like, uh, don't do drugs, don't smoke, don't drink. Yes, living. <gasps> Live, just keep living. When I went to college, I, uh, I had friends who did drugs, but my parents' advice still stayed strong with me. I was like, my parents were smart. They were right about a lot of stuff. I didn't realize that, like, they were the only parents that I ever knew. I didn't have like a double blind experiment with a control group of different, <laughs> different sets of parents saying different stuff. <laughs> so I got pretty lucky. <laughs> like my parents were good. I, there was like worse parents out there, I learned. <laughs> but uh, I didn't even realize at the time that those were like the only ones that I had. So that worked out pretty well. But then after college, I got married. Uh, and there's more to that, but not for here. Uh, so mystery. A boring mystery. Uh, <laughs> my, wife, uh, my wife smoked pot, and she liked it a lot. She was a musician. She said it helped her. Uh, and she was, like, offering it to me, and I was like, no, nah, it's fine. I'm good. I, like, I, I'm fine. I'm happy. I've been, been alive for many years. It's been, go- been going great. Been following the rules, following the path, you know? And if I, if I smoked pot, then I could never go back to never having smoked pot, you know? Would have sullied my perfect record. 
But the same parents that had given me uh, the pathway of, you know, uh, school, college, job, life, they'd also given me like a personal one of those as well. They were like, you know, dating, relationship, marriage, life, you know, love, honor, respect, obey. I don't know if that one's in there for heteronormative men and women. But uh, now here was my beloved, respected, honored wife suggesting an alternate life path. Drugs are good. So out of respect for the institution of marriage, (laughs) as instilled in me by my wonderful parents, (laughs) I tried marijuana for the first time. And I didn't love it. I, I still try it every once in a while to make sure that I still don't love it. I'm not a scientist, but I, I do what I can. But, uh, it was a failed experiment, basically. Like my marriage. So uh, it's fine. She's not here. And also, she doesn't have the internet, maybe. I don't know. But uh, also, she understands and likes jokes. Uh... <laughs> A couple years later, uh, still in my 20s, I tried mushrooms, and uh, those were great. They knew what they were doing. (laughs) People think that pot's a gateway, uh, but I actually think that the gateway is really not enjoying pot. (laughs) Like, if you like pot, then you're just like, I'm good with pot. If you don't like pot, you're like, what else is there? (laughs) It's not like if you tried beets, you're like, mmm, I don't like these. I guess I'm not gonna eat any food. Like, it's not like mushrooms are super pot, you know? Where you're like, oh, if you love pot, you should try super pot. Well, I didn't like pot. You know what I mean? Like, people think that heroin is what, is a gateway from pot to heroin. Like, oh, so many people that end up at heroin started with pot. But most people who do pot don't do heroin. That's like saying, like, kissing is the gateway to sexual assault. Where did I lose you? Okay, so, uh, before I'd done mushrooms, I'd heard of enlightenment. Like, that was a concept, a word that I knew. Like, the same way that I understood, uh, you know, like, Harry Potter's magic powers. Like, those were things that seemed cool, but had no actual context in my real life, you know? Then I did mushrooms. At one time, I was was Jesus, and I was like, oh, that's basically like the original Harry Potter. And uh, I'm not saying that doing mushrooms like help me attain enlightenment or understand enlightenment or become enlightened. That wouldn't be a very enlightened thing for me to say. I'm not saying I get it, but I'm, I don't not get it. I'm in my thirties now, uh, right now. And also in the story about a decade post mushrooms PM, if you want, which also stands for pre-mushrooms because time is meaningless. <laughs> I discovered ayahuasca and now our story begins. Um, the story begins at every point the same way that every point in the universe is the center of the universe and the beginning of a story. And also my story will end even if it seems like it won't and I said it just started. <laughs> ayahuasca is a vine that gets mixed with a leaf and then brewed into a tea and you drink it, and it releases DMT into your brain, which is what happens when we die, if I understand everything correctly, which I'm sure I don't. Uh, It's maybe the world's most powerful hallucinogens. One of them may be responsible for uh, when near-death experiences happen or when this uh, ceremonial uh, ritual happens with ayahuasca, with DMT, and the brain lights up with white colors and... uh, White colors? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, all kinds of conflicts. And... uh, You see your ancestors, maybe your life flashes before your eyes, you see the universe, you see inside yourself, you see all these things, maybe. That's a thing that could happen. Large swaths of my life have been dedicated to sort of trying to reconcile uh, science and magic, you know, the natural and the supernatural, physical and metaphysical. Like in college, I studied uh, philosophy and psychology. Those are things uh, for the brain (laughs) and the body. And uh, I followed, like, you know, scientific study to try and determine, like, what there was. Like, what is there? Like, is there? I liked rules. I liked empiricism. I liked following paths. And I liked 
observable phenomena. Like these are things that were important, but also like, was there more, you know, like, could I see everything? I couldn't see everything. So was there possibly more? Like there could be more, there could not be more. 50-50, so pick whichever one you choose. <laughs> Whatever you like. Um, it's difficult to describe the experience of doing ayahuasca, uh, not only because it's different every time for every person, though if we are all one, then that does take away one of the variables. <laughs> or, or it doesn't, I'm not sure. <laughs> Niels Bohr once said, uh, the opposite of a profound truth is often another profound truth. And then one of his friends said, that sounds wrong. And he's like, yeah, you're right too, probably. <laughs> Before I did ayahuasca, I didn't believe in uh, much supernatural stuff like the soul. You know, I didn't think that we had souls. I thought that we were just, uh, you know, like meat. Our body is meat and like electricity flows through us. So if you're like, what's a human? I'd be like, electric meat. <laughs> probably. But then I did ayahuasca, and now I think that there, I believe in a soul, literally one soul, the soul that is all of our soul. Like, the universe is a soul. The universe is God's soul. If you want to call it that, you can call it anything. Like, it doesn't matter. There's no matter, no energy. Yes matter, yes energy. Hashtag Niels Bohr. <laughs> I, uh, I think differently about a lot of stuff now. Um, like, I don't know if I know anything new. I don't know if I know anything at all, but the same way that before I did mushrooms, I know that I had no idea what enlightenment was, and after I at least had the concept that I had no idea before what enlightenment was. Now I feel the same way after ayahuasca about the universe. Like I know that I am the universe, I'm part of the universe, you're part of the universe, like I am meat and electricity and so are you. We're all recycled star parts that can trace our lineage back to the point like before the Big Bang, at the Big Bang, where, which I understand, if I understand correctly, which I'm sure I don't. Uh, at that point, like we were all one thing and we all are one thing. We all are literally connected because we're one literally connected universe. Or not. <laughs> so my fear of death has mostly become uh, done with. I'm I sort of overcome it. I'm told that you know nothing can ever be created or destroyed. No matter, no energy can ever be created or destroyed. That means that I can never cease to be, be because I've always been or I've never been, and I'm not now. But it seems like I am. So I, I am always, and if I cease to be, it'll only be the same way that like a lap does when you stand up. Or like when groceries get put away. Like they're no longer a lap, and they're no longer groceries. But nothing ceases to be. So in my 20s, I, I basically came to the idea that there was no God, thanks to logic, science, and evidence. And then in my 30s, I decided that I am God. <laughs> and we all are. We're all God. We're all everything. We're all the universe. We can all call it that, whatever you want to call it. I also studied linguistics, so that means that you can use whatever words you want for whatever concepts. And if you know that that's not what linguistics is, shh, I'm talking. <laughs> But because no matter or energy can ever be created or destroyed, basically I used magic drugs uh, to help use science <laughs> to teach me to eliminate fear, which probably didn't exist to begin with because nothing ever can be created or destroyed, so there never was any fear. Basically by teaching me that I am infinite and eternal, and we all are because the universe is, essentially I did a scientific experiment that said, is magic real? And the answer was yes and no, 50-50, so pick whichever one you like. Thanks. That was Mike Kaplan. Mike is a comedian who has been seen on The Tonight Show, Conan, The Late Show with David Letterman, Late Night with Seth Meyers, The Late Late Show with James Corden, in his own half-hour Comedy Central Presents special, and his own one-hour special on Amazon, Small, Dork, and Handsome. He's been a finalist on Last Comic Standing and recently appeared on America's Got Talent. His album, Vegan Mind Meld, was one of the iTunes' top ten comedy albums of the year, and his latest available now is called No Kidding. If you enjoyed today's story or fan of the podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon.com. If you sign up to donate $10 a month or more, we'll list your name in our show programs across the country. The Story Collider is grateful for the support of the Tiffany & Company Foundation and of Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. The Story Collider is directed by Liz Neely and Aaron Barker with help from our many vendors and volunteers. The stories featured in today's podcast were from shows produced by Aaron Barker and Paula Croxon. 
The podcast is produced by Zoe Saunders, and the theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to The Crane and Caveat for hosting these shows, and to Ada, my new dog, who is the best dog in the world, and you can probably hear right now because she's in her spot right next to me. Thanks for listening. Thank you.